have the great pleasure to uh, welcome so many visitors who have found their way today to CERN and to this colloquium. And I'm very glad to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais, who will talk about physics and his method. Dr. Feldenkrais studied physics in Paris. He participated with Julio Curie, Langevin, and Kowarski in the first nuclear fission experiments, which, as you know, have led to the development of the atomic bomb and nuclear energy, thus has have left pretty deep traces on this earth. Dr. Feldenkrais is also an accelerator physicist because he has built the first Van de Graaff accelerator in France. Then, however, he has changed direction, whereas his colleagues continued to go deeper into the details of matter, observing the behavior of particles of particles of particles. He, so to speak, went to the other side of quantum theory, that is the observer or the observing mind, who makes the wave function collapse into reality. And he did some sort of fusion research, at least as successful as his physics colleagues, and certainly much cheaper. That is the fusion between this mind and the human body. Now, I don't want to uh, waste more of this precious time, so I would just like to ask you, please fasten your seat belts so that we can take off into the exploration of one of the most fascinating uh, domains of our life, which still exists, partially unexplored. Please, Dr. Fenntress. I thank you very much. Though I don't know, you probably exaggerated in your compliments as usual. It happens like that, but I find it very difficult to to talk to a new audience every time I do it because unless I have some sort of inner feeling of what the people want, I have no idea what to do because the thing I have to say are a different it's a different way of looking at the world at one night ourselves and at everybody else. Where to start in order to be able to say in one hour something which will make people understand the thing more closely is not a simple thing. I'll tell you one thing. The name of the thing is physics and my method. You will find that physics, in the large sense, is actually fundamental to everything. I will ask you a few questions which will make you what I say afterwards a little bit more interesting and more understandable. Suppose there were no light no light. No light. Can you imagine that there would be eyes in any animal? If there were no light in this world, would there be eyes? Yeah? Yeah, the anaerobic animals, there are some who would live under the ground, they have no eyes. And what for would nature or God or evolution produce eyes if there was no light? And therefore, if you come to think of it, it's only our ignorance of how the world works that we don't know how light has produced vision and eyes. And you believe that if we don't know, that actually very good things that show us how it happened. And we already have more knowledge than it meets the eye. And I can, in one way, I think, being an initiator, that I had the means, and actually today already can show that there is enough knowledge that can be used already to improve things which are beyond the can of humanity. Now, one thing, can you imagine?
religion. That if there were no gravitation, no gravitation, why should God, evolution, or anybody else make a skeleton? Who needs a skeleton if there is no gravitation? Now, if physicists can't explain that yet, it's because they are not busy with it. Yeah. Now, the other things, very important. Our system, the human system, makes invariants. How? What do you mean by invariants? Well, physicists know what the invariants are, but uh, what sort of invariants have we? I'll show you what sort of invariants we have, just to have a minor thing. What's this? Can you see it? Can you tell me what's the size of it? Well, there's no scientific instrument in the world that will not show this as a dot. Insignificant if you look from there at this, yet you see it in its real size. And that, no matter at what distance you see it, it's here, it has the same size to you as it has here. But no camera will have the same size here and there. How, who makes it invariant? No telescope would see it like that. There's no scientific instruments except today we could make something with an electronic computerized thing that would adjust for that and make the size remain invariant. But it's your brain that does it, my brain that does it. How does it do it? Where did it learn to do such a trick? So you can see that unless you start with thinking from that point of view, from a physicist's point of view, from a scientist's point of view, you make no sense of what's happening with us and what we can do and what we can not do. Now let's see how can we explain something to get nearer to some sort of general understanding. We find one extraordinary thing. All animals must learn something. But a cat, or a cub of a tiger, has a few trials. <coughs> Birds have a few trials and they can do everything that their parents can do. Human beings have no inherited instincts or reflexes practically compared with other animals, insignificant. In other words, most animals have a phylogenetic organization of the brain which is connected in the way it is. To give you a silly example, a dog, an Eskimo dog, a South African dog, a Chinese dog, and a Geneva, a Geneva dog bark the same way and understand each other. And even more than that, if they raise their leg and do something on a telegraph post, all of them understand the meaning quite clearly. But in human beings, if you are born in Geneva, you can't understand anybody who is born in Japan. How come? Therefore, how come that the Japanese child learns only Japanese and the Genevan child learns only French? Or a little bit of Italian and German. How come? You, we find that extraordinarily the, the human being has a, a brain which is capable of learning one of the 3,000 languages and 4,000 dialects. But when he comes to the world, he doesn't know one. And he doesn't know one. And the connections are made by whom? 
who connects the brain to produce that sort of breathing, that sort of pronunciation, that sort of palate, that sort of mouth, that sort of standing that will produce, because if you believe it or not, there is not one language that resembles the other in the way the palate is formed. If you listen to some people, there is not, you can tell when somebody talks French and was born in Poland, you will find that he can't say, I love you, he say, I love you, I love you, he doesn't know to say L, and other people can't say Uber, or Bu, or others can't say the Russian Yuri, and Arabs can't say P, they say Palestine, they can't say Palestine. And they say be like boy or be like Bereps. Which means is it a B or a P, but they can't say it. They say be like boy or be like Bereps. <laughs> huh? And in Arabic a, a ship is vapeur. But you know the French came to Egypt first and they was called vapeur. But the Arabs say babor. <laughs> and this is uh, the world over. In other words, the, the, the child learns. And this learning is to, to my mind one of the most important things because there are two learnings, two, two learnings. One learning is you know it's academic learning. Academic learning. It means you can do it or not do it. You can be a physicist and you can be a chemist. And you can be an archaeologist, you can be a lawyer, and you can learn anthropology, and you can learn any damn thing you want. But, and you cannot do it, and you can postpone it. If you fall in love, you say, oh, who wants to learn medicine? I have more important things to do. I want to raise a family. Yeah? So that's possibly easy. Learning, academic learning can be done, not done at will. Can be postponed or taken early, as you wish. But tell me what sort of learning is the one? Could you ever s skate before you can walk? Just think of it. Who could skate before walking? In other words, you, who could walk before crawling? Huh? In other words, there's a kind of learning which has a strict sequence. It must be done like that, and if it's not like that, it just doesn't work at all. And this is the most important sort of learning for becoming a person. A person. It is a, in the first few years of our life we become what we are and we remain like that whether we make, whether we study medicine or thermodynamics. You see, we will remain what we are as a person and this is formed in the first few years of our life and it's done through learning, so it's a peculiar sort of learning of extreme importance. What sort of difference is it between the two? That the learning for a person, not academic learning, is a kind of learning where you learn to do the thing that you know in many different ways. The thing that you know, you learn to do it in many different ways. And humanity has been through that. It's enough to see what it means walking. It means displacing yourself. Do you know that the history of humanity is the history how humanity has learned to displace itself in different means? How many could you count? If you only think on water, if you think on the ground, from walking to riding, to making wheels, to making bicycles, to making <laughs> chariots, to riding horses, to sliding, to gliding, to ski, and 
and all the shipping business, sales and brothers and everything. And the, every one of those achievements were an achievement to the culture of the human species. That made our culture. And as it is now, look, the fact that we could go out of the field of gravitation to the moon is an extraordinary achievement for the human species which makes a change greater than anything else before. Therefore, you see, learning is an extraordinary thing and that's, extreme, and that's extremely important. Now, important in what sense? Important to whom? I say that the way we are, we don't really understand what, what the world is about and what our role is. And what sort of learning, what can we do with ourselves? I believe that most people today never or rarely use 10% of their inborn ability. 10% is the utmost. They can't do any better. Why? Because, because it's enough to see that we have a kind of way of thinking, that we think of human beings as they are when they are grown up. But they aren't like that when they are born. They aren't like that when they are conceived. And then let's see, let's have a think. As we have a short while, I couldn't expose you the long theory of the thing from evolution till today so that it makes sense. Therefore, I'll take a concrete example so that you can see something tangibly. Suppose if we take at every stage of the human being, suppose it built, there's a, a thing which is what? A skeleton. It has a skeleton. That will be the skeleton. Now it has a skeleton, it has muscles. Obviously, you need muscles to be the skeleton. Now, the muscles and the skeleton wouldn't do a thing. What can a muscle do if he get, gets no impulses from somewhere to contract it? So you need a nervous system. By the way, you can see how disconnected. A nervous system, a central nervous system, and nervous system. Then, how could you get a, a, a thing like that without an environment? Could there be a human being without an environment? If there was no environment, they wouldn't know to speak. Obvious. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, that's a nice little boy. <laughs> Hello? Rien, il me sourit. Pourquoi? Hein? J'ai fait sourire plus d'enfants, non seulement heureux comme celui-là, mais d'enfants... Oh, sorry. Sorry. I forgot that I was talking English. I say I made laugh more babies, more unhappy babies than anybody I know in this world. <laughs> so there we have, we have this sort of thing. And you've seen that the learning is important. How would this, this muscle thing and that skeleton thing and that central nervous system learn to speak if they weren't in an environment? Now we will call this the kind of environment at birth. At birth. Then of course it's a minor thing. Or we think so. But then what about making a scheme like that every six months? What happens if you do that again? What happens if you do it every six months? We make a scheme like that and write. What is the environment for a baby at birth? Just somebody holds it, pulls it out, cuts his, the navel, and that's that. That's all the environment. But what's the environment of a child like that when it's six months old? What's the environment of a child like that when it's a year old? A year and a half old? It must 
it learns something. How does it learn? It can't learn through from the environment but through its senses. If it had no senses, it couldn't learn to speak. It couldn't learn to speak a given language. Therefore, how does it learn it? Who teaches it? Who knows how? Huh? Now, it happens like that. But now, when we say environment, at the beginning it's not a mind, but later, is a time, time comes involved. A child of six months wouldn't know what it means half an hour late or half an hour early or what's the time now. Now there must be a time when the child learns to what means to be late and what means to be on time. How does he do that? He learns it from whom? He gets it inherited? <laughs> if he gets it inherited, why does he divide it in 24 hours and in 60 minutes while all, all the other things are never divided anymore in 60s? It's the Babylonians that did that first. Why 60 minutes? Why 60 seconds? Why seven days a week? It's not our production of today. It's a time that people had been counting differently. Now, so the learning begins now. There's time. Now, what about gravitation? If that damn thing will, that baby will not walk, not crawl, and not form a way of walking, how will he walk? How will he come here to that audience? On a wheelchair, carried by somebody? In the, on a wheelchair, how will he sit if he hasn't formed his extensors of the back? Couldn't sit even if he put him in a chair. No. So, there we are. Now we do that at, at, at two years old. Then is it only time? He becomes grandmother and there is a social environment and a cultural environment. In other words, a human being cannot be considered a human being like we think, I am that and that's finished with me. You cannot understand a human being, you cannot understand the woman who came today and had a whiplash in her neck. It can't be understood unless she is part of a society which makes cars and there's regulations and there's some people who can't drive and some people who can drive and bang into a car and make a whiplash. And that has to do something with the environment and with her nervous system. Now, if that is so, why did I leave these things open? Imagine that we have to do after, you see, gravitation, environment, time, society, culture. And then how is the mouth, the, the muscle connected to the skeleton and the central nervous system to the muscle and the central nervous system to the environment? How is it done? And what happens when you, the connections are spoiled? Suppose we are talking about a, a violinist. A violinist who lives three years, he has learned through time, gravitation, society, he has formed his, his language, he has learned his music at the academy and everything all right. And then it happens that he went on a plane and some terrorist shot or brought the plane down or took it somewhere. And this violinist has his hand ruined. The violinist has his hand ruined by a bullet. So, of course, there are at least a thousand, a hundred thousand surgeons in the world who could repair a skeleton properly. Yeah? There are about a hundred thousand first-rate surgeons who would, could transplant and join muscles wherever they were torn or not and organize that. There are another hundred thousand neurologists and, and surgeons who could operate on the brain to do everything necessary to clean it, you know. I don't think it would work all the time so well, but <laughs> it could be that. Now, once 
you have corrected that person, corrected his nervous system, took out all the blood that the fusion from the bank that he got, and corrected his skeleton, corrected his muscles. After that, what do you do? This the neurologist and the psychologist say that arm cannot play the fiddle anymore. So what you do? You're doing some physiotherapy, some acupuncture, some psychotherapy to make that arm more or less acceptable by the violinist. Now, the trouble for the violinist is not the arm. It is really his relation with time, society and culture that is his trouble. It is the fact that he has built his life as a violinist and now he comes, he can't play the, the violin anymore. What's he going to do? How is he going to live? So the trouble is not in the bones and that and nothing there. But nobody can make that man play the violin again. Because you can't play a violin by having a good skeleton and good muscles and a good nervous system. I have a good man and I can't play the violin. <laughs> so what do you do? How come that he lost the ability of playing the violin? It is that he has formed from early childhood. He has used his senses just like learning a language. He has used differentiated his hands, his hearing, his way of acting and the importance of seeing the music and learning to play not to have not to have the apprehension of the public and learning the whole that to become a violinist of repute. It is a job for many 10, 15 years of adjusting our nervous system through the senses to the external world. Huh? Believe it or not. And this being done, you can see that once you have corrected all these things, you still can't play the violin. In other words, you come there and you find here that you need somebody with functional integration, the way we look at it, or the way I have looked at it for many years and evolved. If you do that, then you find that the whole thing has a solution. A solution meaning that in the first place, how did the violinist become a violinist? By taking his senses and using the influence of the external world coming through his senses, making the connections in his brain to play the music, hear the melody and know the notes and know how to differentiate his hands to reproduce the kind of sound that he had in his mind's ear. That took many years to do. Obviously this has nothing to do with the skeleton, has nothing to do with the muscle of the nervous system by itself. There is a kind of learning that the external world through the senses has made the connections in that brain to make a violinist out of it. Now that the violinist is in trouble, it's not by correcting his arm or his muscles or his nervous system that he will become a violinist again. You have to be, you have to use the same sort of technique which formed the violinist in the first place in order to reorganize and restore the kind of kind of thing that can be done, which can of course. Therefore, it's not by making his physiotherapy of the skeleton or massage of the muscles or brainwashing the brain that you will get him to play again. Okay? Therefore, you have to go and find out how we learn, how we get violinists in the first place to find out how to do that. And in fact, this I'm talking of a concrete case, we have done it. And you have heard maybe Ben Torren, who was the first flutist of the Jerusalem Orchestra, Philharmonic Orchestra, he had his median nerve severed and the articulation of the completely destroyed and his arm was like that. 
and he couldn't do it, and everybody advised him to change his profession. It took us about two months. He followed me and my assistants from Israel to America because as I'm going now on the 13th again to America, he couldn't, we couldn't treat him there. He came to America and it took us another six weeks and the man was reintegrated with a destroyed arm and with a severed median nerve, with an arm like this, was reinstated. And the Philharmonic Orchestra to be the first flutist and the orchestra has made a special evening for him and it was in the hall in the press uh, in the world press. You can look at the Jerusalem Post of the time and see that that happened. Now that being so you can see that it's not just a minor thing that you think that way or that way. If we don't realize how we learn how we adjust what a nervous system does in order to learn and that we are the only animal that comes to the world without a phylogenetic organization of the brain, that it must be ontogenetically. Everyone in his own experience learns a language. Everybody in his own experience learns to walk. Everybody in his own experience must do that. You can't do it otherwise. Therefore, we have a, an extraordinary liberty of making connections, of learning from the environment. Now, if you come to think of it, to ask you a question, think one second, think five minutes and see whether you can find an answer. What for has nature, God, or evolution made a, a, a nervous system? Most people, until two centuries ago, three centuries ago, and if many billions of people, of animals down in the world, don't know that they have a nervous system. They know that they have a leg because they can hurt it and they can work with it. They know that they have eyes, they can get blind. But who on earth wants a nervous system? <laughs> Otherwise we don't know it. So the nervous system is there in order that we should not know that we have one. And that's why we grow and we don't know that we have one. So long as we have no trouble, we don't know. Now, when we come to that, we come to the major important thing. What did we say of learning and how do we do it? With what sort of means? We could, everybody knows that you can learn, uh, you can learn music, you can learn mathematics, you can learn uh, dancing, you can learn, uh, and some treatments are even made to work, to music, to dance, to whatever you like. It's possible. You can treat people to breathing, you can treat people to, to applying their hands to do something, you can do that. But the most general thing where people, whereby people can learn is the most important cue to life. The most important cue to life is action movement. Movement is general. There is no human being alive who doesn't move, who can't move. And there is no animal who can't move. As soon as they can't move, it's dead. Move in the most general way. Breathing, moving, uh, being upright. And you will see how this thing goes on if you keep on just following the thing. You will see that it's a new world and uh, enabling the next generation to be infinitely superior to the one we are now. They will look at us as we look at the Middle Ages, as backward people. And that is this. If you, if you take biologically from the start, all living thing, animal or vegetable, must have first, must be self-reproduction. If there is no self-reproduction, there is no species. There is nothing that can work. So that must be so. And the next thing must be self-maintenance. 
Any part, any animal that does not maintain itself, means doesn't take its oxygen, water, food, excretions, to maintenance. If he doesn't get that, how long can he live without air? A few minutes? Not much. The best divers can't live more than five minutes underwater. The best divers, the best pearl divers in the world, can't do more than five minutes. So that's the limit what you can do without self-maintenance. Now, the next thing is self-preservation. Self-preservation. means paying attention of not falling from a rock, not falling into the river, being able to swim, being able to take care of yourself so that you don't slip and break your, driving your car, don't kill yourself, that's self-preservation. And of course this can take a second then you are not there anymore. And all these things, they are essential, not only to the animal life, but only to the, to the vegetation. But there is passive, they can't do a thing. An animal can do something in order to achieve all these things. And what can he do? He can move. Therefore, movement is the most important cue or clue to life. Without that, you can't, sell through, you can't reproduce yourself. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter how potent you are. Don't move and see what happens. <laughs> Self-maintenance. See if you don't find your food, even if, you don't, even if you don't grow it yourself, which needs a lot of work. But even to go to buy it at the supermarket, at the supermarché, you have to move. Doesn't matter how. And the same thing goes for self-preservation. If you don't move properly, you can't self-preserve yourself. And neither of these things can be done without movement in general action. Therefore, the observation, how do the learning happen in such a way and as you see, the person has learned the language, has learned to move, has learned the time. Nobody knows really how to teach it. And therefore, it's bound to be with errors. And the learning that we're talking about is impossible without errors. Learning without errors is not learning. It's imitation of somebody. Learning must be, you must make errors and find out that they are errors. Then you can learn to, to eliminate them and make your move. Think of a bicycle. Can you do, learn to drive a bicycle without making errors? If you couldn't sit on the bicycle and drive without errors, you have nothing to learn. But then you sit on the bicycle, the bicycle will always work in such a way that you will have to eliminate one error after the other until you can ride it. In other words, in learning, if you don't give yourself the ability to understand that errors are essential in real fundamental learning, you just don't think about learning. That's not learning. Without errors, it's impossible to learn. Just like without errors, it's impossible to make nuclear research or any research whatsoever. If you know what you're going to do, and you don't know the, the errors on the way, you don't know what sort of research is it when you know the end of the research. Huh? <laughs> do you? What the use of making it? What's the use of making CERN if you know the result already? <laughs> so obviously when you make a thing like that, you're bound to make errors. Errors of judgment, errors of, of experimentation. Same thing in our life. It's impossible to become a normal human being, more or less. 
normal? Well, I don't believe that there are many normal human beings among us here, me included, because that's not normal, that's the average. And the average is just as backward as anybody else. And if you want to see something, look at it now. I wonder how I will introduce so much new ways of looking at things in such a very short time, but somehow it works, I believe. from these things to more concrete things in our lives. How do I know to stand? How do you know to stand? You couldn't when you were born. You couldn't for the first year. You could only crawl. How did you get to stand? And how do we stand today? And how do I know? And if you look a little bit to yourself, how we got from the movement, how we got to be able to stand, and moreover, look, if I turn my eyes to you in any way, if you call me or I see something, you find that I stand in the side at which I turn my eyes, the two eyes or the two ears, or my nostrils or my mouth, make it that this side becomes tonified to the extreme and the other one not. So, and you see the sternocleidum astigian on this side and the eyes. And there's no whether you know, many of you might probably do, the work of Magnus Magnus from the University of Utrecht, who showed the writing and tonic reflexes of the eyes and the head, which are essential for standing and moving as we do. In other words, when I turn my eyes to see somebody, I find this side, you see, gets tonified and the other one toneless, so that I can turn and remove the asymmetry of the eyes and the neck, and that re-establishes equal tonus on both sides. Therefore, you can find that if we learn all that is learned, and it's so complex, and uh, nobody knows actually what they teach the children. They just let them grow and teach them by example or some. And errors are com committed all the way along. And the errors nobody actually knows about them until the people are grown up and they go themselves to seek some sort of help from, from a psychotherapist of a sort or acupuncture or whatever it is. And then of course the whole thing, they take the human being as it, it is already there and believe that now if they got that thing and they will do this or that, it will change something really fundamentally. Yeah? That is correct with the car. That is correct with the bicycle, but it's not correct with the human brain that has, from the start, from the initiate, from the conception, has had to form and learn from the environment to make his own ontogenetic, his own personal connections, so that in the same family, from the same parents, four children are not the same. They are not the same because of what? Their DNA is the, practically the same. Everything is the same except what? Their personal experience. And in the human species, the learning is the most important personal experience for anybody. It has a greater influence on their future life in society and the, their opinion about themselves than their DNA. But of 
course, the first three years of the learning that we talked about, not academic learning, forming their person. Now we find then when they come, when they grow up and they have no ability to enjoy life the way they would like to have it, surely there's a means of having a look how did they learn to work in this world and find out which are the errors they have committed and which are the errors they have not corrected and which are the compulsive sort of attitudes they have in which they have no say. The human prerogative is that he has a choice. Human learning in itself is that they have the ability of doing the same thing in at least three different ways. That's the minimum. Because if you have no, no, you have only one way, then it's compulsive. Whatever you do, it's the same thing. You have no other choice. Whether you want it or not, it's a compulsive attitude. It's a compulsive act. Now, the next one, which is common to all animals and everybody, is two choices, yes or no. You do it or you don't. That's a two choice. That's the every animal. The, every medusa has that choice to move or not to move, to do or not to do. And then, of course, the human choice must be a, at least a minimum of three choices for any act that you know. At least. And, by the way, if you have no choice, you are just like any other machine. Like any, you may be a first rate computer, but you have. You are not human. We are not human if we have no choice. If we have no choice in acting, and I can say, I do that at my choice, I think like that, I feel like that, what's the difference between a, com a good computer, a good robot, and me if I have no choice? The robot makes you do it much better than I. But it's still a robot. The robot can't work, can't make me, I can make a robot. Because I have the choice, he hasn't. Now, I don't know how far... Further I told you about it. I think maybe you leave you some sort of ability to ask questions, which I will maybe elucidate the thing a little clearer than that. I believe that there's so many things and so many different things put in together in such a way, I don't know how many of you got something out of it which will make them understand their future life differently. Is there anybody who has any particular question to ask? say that in the, the, if you have less than three choices, you have actually no choice. Because yes and no is no choice. I can speak and not speak in that every animal, the, the, the smallest and the most Insignificant animal can also do or not do, eat or not eat, reproduce or not reproduce. But there is a choice already in the yes and no. A yes and no is no choice. You have no choice. Tell me yes and no, can you do them together? You can't. Because for the yes, your entire nervous system is occupied in doing yes. And for doing no, your entire system is occupied to doing no. We can't, in our system, make yes and no at the same time, can we? Can you think yes and no at the same time? In words, yes. But you do that and don't do it at the same time. Cross your hands and don't cross them at the same time. Your entire system is involved in crossing, and your entire system is involved in uncrossing. Therefore, it's no choice. You haven't decided anything. You just can't do otherwise. 
it's machine learning. You can do something if you can decide I will do that or I won't do that. Can you do it that way or do it that way? Then of course you have a choice. Therefore, you can't have actually very healthy, strong people have more than one, have 15 choices. To give you an example with which you probably find it easier to, to follow that. Suppose how do people love, I mean, men and, and women, how do they love? Suppose you have only one choice. Would it be love? Would it be a thing that it depends on you? Subsistence of the, of the, of the progenitor. The mother is more interested. Some mothers have sacrificed their lives for the child to live. You see, that sort of attitude, if you can, you as a therapist, produce that similarity and produce a touch, disinterested, but interested in you, not in what you are to me, then you will find that you will inwardly begin to tell your kinesthetic sense to find out where, what it does to you in such a way that you will never be able to do it otherwise. Kind of touch, the kind of thing that will allow the nervous system to get into the best of its organization. I have seen things like that, that a, a baby, three weeks old, the mother says there is something wrong with his ear. She goes to the doctor and he looks and he says nothing. And then it turns out that the mother was right. Two months, three months later, I've seen mothers who had a child which has a, had some sort of trouble with his motor function. And she was to about a dozen different doctors. Everybody examined and made scanning and did all the tests and said nothing. And then when the child was four and a half years old, it was as obvious as anything that the right side is practically paralyzed. And the mother has said it from the first day that she had the child in her hand. Now how did she know? She didn't. But she was interested in the survival of the child more than anything else. And therefore she can produce a kind of attitude which the therapist today, if he touches you, therefore if somebody outside is a real friend to you, a real friend in that sense that he doesn't want anything of you, anything to gain from you, just to assist you to get a better contact with yourself, you will find that that person will actually remind you, evoke in you very old unconscious feelings that you knew only when you were a baby. And therefore also anybody who comes there and wants to cure you and wants to do you something and tells you, look, I tell you, you must do something, you must change the way you live, otherwise it won't work. He has a chance of helping you. You know, a need is the savior of the you the frost. It means like the, the cold of last year. There's no chance. Doesn't matter what sort of therapist he is or she is.